be among the first to congratulate the Hume and the O'Neill families for um, their contribution to making this chair possible, uh, for extending the legacy of peace uh, and uh, for, for generations to come. Uh, and I think it's a very important thing and uh, something that all of us need to uh, work towards because our world today is torn apart and we need to do something to learn to live together. I would also like to congratulate the university for establishing this chair in memory of uh, John Hume and uh, Thomas P. O'Neill. And I hope that this chair will uh, serve the purpose of bringing peace into the world uh, and, and teaching people what peace really means. And of course, I would like to congratulate my friend, uh, Brandon uh, Hamber, uh, for being the first person to chair this uh, very important uh, institution. And I wish him luck in his uh, endeavor to spread peace throughout the world. When I heard Brandon speak in Colombia, I was very happy that uh, he was among the very few scholars who really understood my grandfather's philosophy and was pretty close to uh, practicing it in his uh, work. Uh, I say this because I've seen many scholars who only focus on peace building as a conflict resolution program. But we all know that peace building is much more than just conflict resolution. It's also about learning how to prevent conflicts. Because if we don't prevent the conflicts and if we keep on resolving conflicts in a culture of violence, we are just going to perpetuate conflicts over and over again and ultimately people get tired and say peace doesn't work and we need to fight it out and get this over with. So it's important for us to remember this. My grandfather was very concerned about the culture of violence that we have created in this world. A culture of violence that dominates every aspect of our lives. It's, uh, our language has become uh, violent, our entertainment is violent, our sports violent, our relationships are violent. Everything about us has become violent. And in this kind of a culture of violence, we would find it very difficult to preserve peace, not only build it, but to preserve it. We have to change that culture of violence, and that is what my grandfather domin uh, dominated his life and his work toward making us understand what uh, it means to transform the culture of violence to a culture of nonviolence. I had the privilege as a young boy to uh, go and stay with him between the age of 12 and 14. And although the lessons that he taught me were very simple, modest lessons to become understandable for a 12, 13 year old boy, they had a real profound meaning to those lessons. And they, when I grew up and began to reflect on uh, these lessons, I realized how important they were to his philosophy as well as to our uh, personal lives. Because one of the things that he emphasized during his life was that peace has to be begin with us, each one of us. We cannot build peace outside if we are not at peace with ourselves. And how do we become peaceful within ourselves. And these are the lessons that he taught me. As Brandon said, I was born and brought up in South Africa. 
and during the apartheid years and I suffered a lot of prejudices both at the hands of the whites as well as the blacks. I was beaten up at the age of 10 by whites because they thought I was too black and then by blacks because they thought I was too white. And it filled me with a lot of rage and I wanted eye for an eye justice. And that's when my parents decided it was time to take me to India and give me the opportunity to live with grandfather and hopefully learn something from him. And I'm very grateful to them for taking that decision because in many ways the uh, two years that I spent with grandfather really changed my life and made me understand what his philosophy is all about. The very first lesson that he taught me was about understanding anger and being able to use that energy constructively. We all get angry all the time for one reason or the other, but we never talk about it, we never learn about it, and so all of us end up abusing anger. And what grandfather told me was that anger is like electricity. It's just as useful and just as powerful but only if we use it intelligently, but it can be just as deadly and destructive if we abuse it. So just as we channel electrical energy and bring it into our lives and use it for the good of humanity, we must learn to channel anger in the same way so that we can use that energy for the good of humanity rather than abuse it and cause death and destruction. Today, experts tell us that more than 85% of the violence that we experience in our lives or the lives of our nations is generated by anger. We get angry and we explode and we say things and do things that we regret later on. And yet we don't have to do that. If we learn that anger is a very powerful and a very useful emotion and needs to be channeled effectively, then we would be able to use anger to resolve issues rather than abuse anger and cause violence. He taught me that anger, we need to write an anger journal. He said every time you get angry, don't act on it, don't say anything or do anything that you're going to regret. But write a journal but write the journal with the intention of finding a solution to the problem and then commit yourself to finding a solution, which is very important because today a lot of people tell me they've been writing an anger journal for a long time, but it hasn't really helped them because every time they go back and read the journal, they are just reminded of the incident and they get angry all over again. So we don't want the journal to be a reminder of the incident. We want the journal to help us find a solution to the problem. And I did this for many years. And I must say it helped me considerably in learning how to channel the energy of anger into constructive action. But for that, we also need a very strong mind. And unfortunately, again, we don't pay any attention to our mind at all. We are very conscious about wanting a very strong and healthy body. We do all kinds of exercises and jogging and running and, and all of these things to build a strong, healthy body. But we never ever do any exercise to build a strong mind. We just assume that going to college and schools and learning and reading, uh, and that, that is enough exercise for the mind. But that is not exercise. It is like getting an old computer and feeding it with new software. And it doesn't really work very eff efficiently. And so we need to learn to strengthen our mind. One of the ways in which we determine how weak our mind is, is to see how many different thoughts are racing through our mind at the same time 
as we are sitting here and listening to people talk. And we'll find that there are dozens of thoughts going on in our mind at the same time. And to that extent, we are all distracted. But if we strengthen our mind, then we have control over the mind and we are able to focus on what is happening at the moment without being uh, distracted there. What he made me do was to sit quietly in a room for a few minutes every day, hold in front of me a flower, or a photograph of some, something that gives me pleasure to look at and concentrate for one minute on that object and then close my eyes and see for how long I can keep that image in my mind's eye. In the beginning I found the moment I closed my eyes the image vanished. But when I began to do this exercise regularly every day, I found that I could keep that image longer and longer in my mind's eye and to that extent my mind was coming under my control and I could focus 100% of my attention and energy to what was happening at the time and not be distracted by other thoughts. So it's important for us to have that strong mind so that we can stop ourselves from acting in a moment of madness and doing something that we are going to regret later on. But after learning this profound lesson from him, I was a 13-year-old boy at the time and I decided to test grandfather and see whether he himself had learned the lesson or not. And this was the time in his life when he was involved in many important things. He was not only uh, fighting for India's independence, but he was also concerned about the emancipation of Indian women, the education of uh, poor children, and uh, the emancipation of the so-called low caste people. All of these things were very important to him, and he needed funds for all these programs. And he realized that the easiest way for him to raise the money was to sell his autograph. And every morning and evening, when hundreds and sometimes thousands of people attended his prayer services, and as Tom said, he considered himself to be a Hindu, a Buddhist, a Jew, a, a Christian. He considered himself to be everything, all in one. And so his daily prayer services included prayers from all of these different religions. And we would sit in a hall like this on a bad day or we would sit outside in the open on a good day. And every morning and evening we would have these prayers. And the congregation was made up of all the different religious groups. Because anybody who knew that Gandhi was in town, they knew that there would be prayers at five o'clock in the morning and five o'clock in the evening, and they would just come there to be part of those prayers. So he took the advantage of selling his autographs during those prayer services. After the prayers, people would all line up to get his signature. And while I was living with him, it was my duty to go out into the audience and collect these autograph books and bring it to him for his signature. And I had to make sure that the money was along with each of those books there. He had put a fee of five rupees for each autograph. And one day I thought to myself, I said, everybody gets his autograph, why not me? After all, I'm his grandson and I deserve an autograph too. But I didn't have any money. And so I got myself a little autograph book and I slipped it into the pile, hoping that he wouldn't notice the absence of money. But when he came to that autograph, he said, why is there no money for this autograph? And I said, because it's my book. And he said, well, you should know that I don't make an exception even for grandsons. <laughs> that if you want an autograph, you'll not only have to pay me for it, but you'll have to earn the money and pay me don't ask your parents for it. And I said, no way. I said, you are my grandfather and I'm going to make you give this autograph free. 
So he laughed and said, all right, let's see who wins. And from that day, every day when he was in high-level political discussions with Indian politicians or British politicians, I would barge into the room with my autograph book and thrust it in his face and demand an autograph. My logic was that just to get rid of me, he would sign the book and give it to me. But instead, every time I became too boisterous, all he did was put his hands across my mouth, press my head against his chest, and went on talking politics. <laughs> on many occasions, the other politicians used to get exasperated and tell him, why don't you give him the autograph? He disturbs our meetings every day. And he would just laugh and say, this is a private joke between the two of us. You don't have to get involved in it. But the long and short of it is that he never did give me the autograph. <laughs> but he never ever told me to get out of the room and leave him alone. As we often do with our children or our siblings, if we are working on something important, we shoo them out, sometimes very rudely telling them to get out, can't you see, I'm busy. He never ever did that to me. And that's when I realized that if he was able to control his anger to that extent, if we attempt to achieve 50% of it, we would make a tremendous difference in the level of violence that we experience today. So anger is a very important aspect of the peace process and, and learning how to uh, channel that energy of anger into positive, constructive action. But it's also very important for us to remember that his philosophy of nonviolence was not simply a philosophy for uh, ending wars or ending violence. It has much deeper connotations. And I realized this one day through a little pencil, a little three-inch butt of a pencil, became the subject for a major lesson. I was coming back from school and I had this little three-inch pencil with, in my hands and I thought I deserved a better pencil. This was too small for me to use. And without second thought, I just threw the pencil away on the roadside because I was so sure that grandfather would give me a new pencil when I asked him for one. But that evening when I asked grandfather for a new pencil, Instead of giving me one, he subjected me to a lot of questions. He wanted to know how the pencil became small and where did I throw it away and why did I throw it away and on and on. And I couldn't understand why he was making such a fuss over a little pencil until he told me to go out and look for it. And I said, you must be joking. He said, you don't expect me to look for a little pencil in the dark? He said, oh yes, I do. He has a flashlight. And he sent me out with a flashlight to look for this pencil and I think I must have spent about two hours searching for it. And when I finally found it and brought it to him, he said, now I want you to sit here and learn two very important lessons. The first lesson is that even in the making of a simple thing like a pencil, we use a lot of the world's natural resources. And when we throw them away, we are throwing away the world's natural resources, and that is violence against nature. The second lesson is that because in an affluent society we can afford to buy all these things in bulk, we overconsume the resources of the world, and because we overconsume them, we are depriving people elsewhere of these resources, and they have to live in poverty and that is violence against humanity. And that was the first time I realized that all of these little things that we do every day, consciously and unconsciously, things that have become so much a part of our nature because of the culture of violence that we live in, that all these things are acts of violence. To make me understand this thoroughly, he made me do a genealogical tree of violence, just as we do a family tree, with violence as the grandparent, and physical violence and passive violence as the two branches. 
And every day before I went to bed, I had to analyze and examine everything that happened during the day. Things that I may have done to others or others may have done to me. All of these things had to be analyzed and examined and put in their appropriate places on that tree. If it was the kind of violence where we use physical force, that would naturally go under physical violence. But if it's the kind of violence where we don't use any physical force, and yet we hurt people, like discrimination, oppression, hate, prejudice, uh, wasting resources, overconsumption of things, hundreds of things that we do every day unconsciously. The way I had to determine whether this is passive violence or not was to ask myself, if somebody were to do this to me, would it hurt me or would it help me? And if I came to the conclusion that it would hurt me, then that would be passive violence. And when I began to do this introspection, it was a form of introspection to find out my own weaknesses. I was amazed that within a few months I was able to fill up a whole wall in my room with acts of passive violence. The physical violence didn't grow very much because there's a limit to what you can do physically. But the passive violence this was endless. And then he explained the connection between the two. He said, we commit passive violence all the time, every day, consciously and unconsciously, and that generates anger in the victim, and the victim then resorts to physical violence to get justice. So it is passive violence that fuels the fire of physical violence. So logically, if we want to put an end to the fire of physical violence, we have to cut off the fuel supply. And since the fuel supply comes from each one of us, we have to become the change we wish to see in the world. If we don't change ourselves and change our attitudes, we are never going to be able to create the peace lasting peace that we all want. So in his concept, peace was when all of us could live in harmony with each other, with nature and with each other. It was only then that we would have true peace. Just simply ending wars is not enough. We have to learn to create those, that harmony. We have brought about peace on many occasions. We have brought about peace in Ireland. Um, uh, Mr. O'Neill and, uh, and Mr. Hume did a wonderful job of bringing about peace. But we shouldn't sit back and think that that is the end of the program. That is the beginning of the program. We still have a lot of work to do to purge our minds of the hate and the prejudice that exists there and try to build a society where, all, where there is harmony and, uh, and respect for each other. And that takes various forms. The chair would be one of the ways in which we educate people. Our education system should be more than just giving children uh, a, a, a career in life to make money. It has to be some uh, a type of education that teaches them about their responsibility and, their, uh, and the mo moral obligations that all of us have to live in a, a, a proper society. The education system needs changing. Today, our education system, unfortunately, is simply about giving them careers so that they can go out and make a lot of money. It's all about materialism. It's all encouraging materialistic lifestyle. And materialism and morality have, has an inverse relationship. The more materialistic we become, the less moral we are. And we can see this in everyday life all the time. So we have to be conscious of this and we have to make all these different efforts to bring about that kind of peace. Another thing that troubled my grandfather very much was the kind of relationships that we had. 
Because of materialism, our relationships with each other are based on self-interest. We are always thinking about what am I going to gain from this relationship? And if I don't gain anything from it, why should I bother to cultivate it? And when we have that kind of an idea, the relationship is never on a sound footing. It's always very delicate relationship and it breaks off very quickly when we stop getting anything from each other. But in a non-violent, in a culture of non-violence, Relationships are based on four principles of respect, understanding, acceptance, and appreciation. We have to respect ourselves and respect each other and respect our connection with all of creation. We are not individual people. We are part of this whole society. We are part of this whole creation. We have to respect that. We are all interconnected, interrelated, and if we don't respect that, then, then we are not doing the right thing. It's only when we respect that fact that we will understand who we are and what we are and why are we here on earth. We are not here to while away our time from birth to death. We are here to fulfill a purpose. And the basic purpose that we all have is to make the society in which we live better than we had found it. And that can only be done when we make ourselves better than we were. One of the things that my grandfather taught us was to get up every morning and tell ourselves that we are going to be better human beings today than we were yesterday. And to be able to do that, we had to have a list of all our weaknesses. And then every day make ourselves deal with each of those weaknesses to transform them into strength. The whole idea was that we have to enhance ourselves to grow and become better human beings then. So when we do that, when we reach that understanding, then we will be able to accept each other as human beings and not identify people by the labels we have put upon ourselves. Today we have so many labels to identify people that we have forgotten that behind those labels there is a human being. We have gender labels, religious labels, economic labels, national labels, you name it and we have a label. So we have got to remove those labels and just begin to look at each other as human beings and uh, respect each other as human beings. And when we are able to do that, then we will appreciate our own humanity. So these are the principles on which good relationships are built in a, in a culture of nonviolence. And that is what we need to learn to bring about that transformation. And that's why he always emphasized the fact that we must become the change we wish to see. We cannot change the world if we refuse to change ourselves. So we have to identify all our weaknesses, all our uh, uh, well weaknesses and transform those weaknesses into strength. Then we will truly be practicing nonviolence and truly create a world where peace and harmony can prevail. I want to conclude with one final story that my grandfather used to be very fond of telling us. The story of an ancient Indian king who once became very curious about the meaning of peace. And he invited all the people, intellectuals in his kingdom to come and explain the meaning of peace. And everybody came and did their best, but nobody could really satisfy the king. And then there was an intellectual who came for a, from another town and uh, he stopped by to pay his homage to the king 
and the king asked him the meaning of peace. And he said, the only person who can give you a satisfactory answer is an old sage who lives outside your kingdom. But he is so old that he cannot come to you. You will have to go to him and ask him this question. And so the next day the king went to the sage and asked him the meaning of peace. And the sage quietly went to the back of the house, came back with a grain of wheat and placed that grain of wheat on the king's palm and said, here is your answer. And of course the king didn't know what a grain of wheat had to do with peace and he didn't want to show his ignorance. So he quietly clutched that grain of wheat and went back to his palace and found a little gold box, placed that grain of wheat in the box and every morning he would get up and look for an answer and couldn't find any answers. So a few days later when this intellectual came back on a return visit, the king confronted him and said, you sent me to the sage, he gave me this grain of wheat and I don't know what a grain of wheat has to do with peace. And that's when the intellectual said, it's very simple. He said, as long as you keep this grain of wheat in this box, nothing is going to happen. It will eventually rot and perish and that's the end of the story. But if you had planted this grain of wheat in the soil outside. It would sprout and grow and very soon you could have a whole field of wheat. And that is the meaning of peace. That if somebody has found peace and if they keep it locked up in their hearts, it will perish with them. But if we let it interact with all the elements, it would spread and grow and very soon we could have a whole world of peacemakers. So I'm here today to give you the grain of wheat that I got from my grandfather and I hope that you won't let it rot and perish but let it interact so that all of us together can make the dream that Mr. O'Neill and Mr. Hume cherish to make this place a better place for future generations. Thank you.